Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is, uh, so m for those of you that don't know me, my name is uh, Phil Yules and I work at the National Genomics Infrastructure up on Alpha 3 at SciLife Lab. Um, and this is the second talk in the SciLife Lab Big Talks, where Big stands for Bioinformatics and Genomics seminar series. Uh, this is being co-organised between NGI, the Genomics Infrastructure, and NBIS, the Bioinformatics Platform. Um, so normally this introduction would be done by Jessica from uh, Bioinformatics Platform, but she's not here today. So I'm just, she asked me to give a quick introduction to what the Big Talks series is. So sorry, Paolo, we'll be with you in a second. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea behind the Big Talks is to have inspirational speakers, um, for there to be networking um, possibilities between all different people working in bioinformatics and genomics within SciLife Lab, which basically means coffee. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and the location of the different talks will rotate between the different SciLife Lab nodes. Um, and it's co-organized between these two platforms. Um, so the first talk was in June uh, in Uppsala. Um, today we have uh, Paolo talking here in Stockholm. The next talk will be in uh, either no November, December. Unfortunately, don't know when, where, or who just yet. <laughs> but there will be one. Um, and the idea is that they will be uh, live streamed to YouTube, so available to anyone who's interested in tuning in. We can get the live streaming today, but we're trying to record it, so hopefully this will appear up on YouTube afterwards. Um, so, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Paolo, um, who's come from Barcelona to talk to us today. He's the lead developer behind Nextflow, which is an increasingly popular um, workflow tool, which is very powerful, and very flexible, and can be used in genomics to great success, but also in other, other fields as well. We were talking earlier about proteomics. Um, so Paolo works at the CRG in Barcelona with a fantastic beachfront location, yeah. it's a good place to settle. Uh, <laughs> um, originally Italian, uh, but you said you've been in Barcelona for eight years now, yeah. so uh, working in the group of Cedric Notterdam. Um, so with that, I think I will hand over okay. and uh, let, you, let you start your talk. Okay, so thank you, thank you, Phil, for the introduction, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to talk to you about my experience to, in the problem of reproducibility with genomic pipelines, and how we try to, to solve this problem with this tool, with this framework that is NACLO, which we are developing in our lab. So um, Phil already introduced me, so just take just the opportunity to show the beautiful building of CRG, just in front of the scene. And uh, so, what are the, the main points of, of the, this talk? At least the, some things I would like to talk to you today. What? We start with a small introduction with the challenges to use the computational workflow, what are the main problems, and how we are trying to, to solve, at least mitigate part of this problem using this tool that is next to. Some of the main ideas behind this tool, what are the, the main principles that are used in this framework, and then I would like to, to tell us a bit more how we manage the parallelization and scalability of genomic application using this, this application. Then, in conclusion, if we have time, has more comparison with other tools, with other platforms, and then some ideas, future plans that we are, we are, we are going to, to move this, this project. So, genomic workflow. Uh, I don't want to lecture you today about genomic workflow. I, I, I'm sure that you know much more than me, but just to put this so in the context, well, we could say that genomic workflow are just data analysis application that extract information from big data analysis, no? And a typical run can produce some terabytes of data, and genomic workflow are real big data application, the real definition. There is an interesting paper that came out in 2015 where there, there was an estimation for genomic data, uh, human genomic data, they predicted it will require from two to 40 exabytes is a letter, a letter search, much more than the, the search required to see all YouTube video. No? So this is really a, a, a challenging uh, kind of analysis. And they are characterized, at least from a computational point of view, from two characteristics, in my opinion. There is a big need for parallelization because we need to, to crunch all this data in an efficient manner with big cluster computer. And the most common approach to parallelize this application just using what is called an embarrassing parallelization approach, in the meaning that we have a single task, 
So you replicate the same task with across your data set. This is the, job, the, 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 the main idea, but the, the, the principle is that, so you replicate the same task over a common data set, or maybe you can split a big data file into chunks, or you replicate the, the execution of the same task over a class of the computer. And uh, uh, this kind of application can last <coughs> from 100 to 100,000 jobs, if not more. We think, for example, a single cell workflow can execute, can require the execution of million jobs. So the problem is how to manage the orchestration, the, 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 the prioritization on this, this workflow in an efficient manner. And the other characteristic that is very common in genomic workflow is that they are written using a scripting language. Mostly they can be Python or Perl or Bash. Why? Because it's very common, it's very easy to, to put together different pieces of software developed by other people, by other researchers. And this is efficient, is fast, allows you to quickly prototype a, uh, an application. The problem is that have some technical debt, how to say. They tend to have a lot of dependencies, make it difficult to install, to maintain. They tend to create a very fragile ecosystem of tools that are difficult to install, to maintain. Just to give you the idea of real world application, generally more flow, this is the, the flow chart of the companion pipeline. It is a, a parasite genomic application pipeline developed somewhere, has been published a couple of years ago. And I don't want to, to enter in the, key, the details of the application, but just to give the, the visual idea of the complexity on you know, the flow chart, we are not talking about a workflow made two, three, four steps, one after another, but there are really a lot of different tasks that need to be executed in parallel, so we need a simple way to define all the parallelization and the, the coordination between these tasks. Um, I think this, this workflow, there are something like 70 different tasks, and to, to run this piece of software, you need to store also another 40 different libraries, tools, packages in the, in the target system. So if you don't have a proper way to manage all the, 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 the configuration of these things, it's really a complex problem. And usually I like to mention also this paper where these people try to quantify the average effort to replicate a typical competition of biology paper. And they found out that they are needed, on average, 280 hours only to replicate a paper, not to, to implement new methods. These are nearly two months to, 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 to replicate an experiment already implemented, no? So this is clear the signal that is something broken, that is not, uh, in which is not using the, the, the right approach. Either we would like to have a much simpler way to replicate a paper. Why should it supposed to be so, so complicated? And so, what's the point? Uh, I like this metaphor. When we have to, to replicate a paper or a computation workflow, it's like to put them together a puzzle. We have to install all these, these, these two different dependencies. I need to configure a package, set some variable variables. So, a lot of different pieces that you need to put together to have the final picture. And my point is that in, in the puzzle, you may be able at some point to recreate this, this picture, but with a computational workflow, you may be in a position that you are not even able to recreate the identical figure that you were expecting. What I want to mean, I want to say that some application, the same application deploying different execution environment can produce different results. This is not the exact, the opposite definition of a replicable workflow. So what's the problem? This is what we, we show this paper that we published in the past year, Nature Biotech, running this pipeline that I show, was showing you before, the companion pipeline, different, different platform. We use an Amazon Linux environment in the cloud, and then a Debian uh, workstation, and then a Mac OS operating system. The same pipeline, in the same platform, was producing the same number in a deterministic manner, but across different execution, different installation of the same pipeline was producing different numbers. So this is make no sense at all. It's true that, it's not big, that there are no big um, variations in this number, but still there is a discrepancies. And above all, we were not able to predict the discrepancies. We were completely, uh, sorry, make no sense. So what if this discrepancy was much bigger, and if we are going to take a decision, a treatment, 
on the number introduced by this pipeline. So this can potentially be very harmful, very dangerous. And so the point with this, the point is to make it possible to have a real record pipeline you guarantee that you have the same result independently, the platform on which we are working. You, we need a consistent uh, method that guarantee the deployment and execution is piece of code across any uh, target uh, installation producing the same result. So the problem of reproducibility, also the problem of portability to enable the, the application to be deployed in different execution environment without having to implement the application. Then we have another problem with scalability, for the reason I was telling you before, we would like to have a mechanism to simplify the execution complex pipeline in a large cluster of computer without having to invest, to spend too much time in the implementation or the, the parallelization of your pipeline. Either if this is something you would like to delegate to something, to, to the framework that we are using, you would like instead to concentrate what? In the, the logic of your pipeline, not the implementation part. And then also what? The usability. So streamline the execution to, 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 to this application in a simple way so that the end user is going to run the, this piece of software does not have to spend days to configure this piece of software. But uh, Italy we would like to have a framework that hides this complexity allows me to, to, to execute with few commands a uh, big analysis workflow. And finally, the problem is the problem of the consistency is the meaning that we would like to have a, a, a way that allow us to, to track all the changes, not just in the, uh, in the source code of your application, but also the, the, the possible parameter in your data analysis workflow and what else. And, and above all, the configuration file, the binary dependencies that define an important part of your, your application because they define the execution context. If you're if you uh, track only the change in the source code, but you are not able to track the execution context, you have done half of the work. And so, in the ideal world, you would like to have what I call a push the button, push the button, pipeline, line, the meaning that you have just a single action that allows you to run, to carry out a big analysis workflow without having to take care to many parameters, too many variables. And the point of how, how we can implement this, uh, this magical solution somehow. And when we started to work this project, we take in consideration some, 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 some required feature. The first thing that we wanted to have a fast prototype approach for our pipeline, for the reason that I was telling you before, so scientists want to work fast on, on a deal, on a hypothesis, don't want to spend too much time on low level implementation details. For this reason, the point was to to enable fast prototyping or uh, genomic workflow or a scientific workflow more in general using a custom DSL. DSL is a domain specific language that allows you to implement a declarative manner uh, recurrent task in your, your, in your, do your domain, your specific application. But the beauty of DSL is that a DSL is implemented on top of, of a general purpose pregnant language. This gives us a lot of flexibility compared to other meta declarative languages that are more, you, that use other formal like JSON or YAML. In that case, you are confined to a specific definition. And you, uh, you are not, you, you, are, you don't have much flexibility. You are confined to the, to the primitive give that meta language. Instead, with the DSL, we can cover uh, the, the co most common part with the, the primitive provided by the you know, specific language, the DSL. But at the same time, when there are specific problems, corner cases, we can still use the general purpose pregnant language to mix the two. So this is a very powerful, uh, uh, how to say, flexible approach. The other way was, the other problem was to, to enable the parallelization of the, 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 the application. Here, the idea was to to provide what? To use a declarative reactive programming, mo programming model based on the data flow paradigm. Uh, this simplified the, the, the definition of the application because you don't have to take care to low level implementation details like synchronization and logs that are typical of parallel concurrent programming. 
And this way, I will show you later more, you just define a parallelization from high point of view, high level. And then another, another important point was to decouple the components in a pipeline. A more, a more simple way to decouple, to decouple the, the different tasks that you have in your pipeline. Usually when you look at a pipeline skip, you find a huge mess of, 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 of task definition that are mixed all together. It is impossible to, 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 to modify or replace some part when using what is a general, what is called a spaghetti code style. The standard idea was to, to, to allow the clear separation of each task so that the developer can focus on a single task. And this allows also to create, to extend the pipeline in a much easier manner. And finally, how to enable portable deployments. And here the idea was to implement an abstraction layer that allows to define the pipeline in a portable manner and then delegate to this abstraction layer the execution to different execution platforms. There can be a Slack cluster, another kind of cluster, or maybe the cloud. So all these things are mixed part, are the ideas behind this tool that is next to this project, that try to keep together all these aspects, the orchestration and parallelization of the pipeline, giving the ability to scale the same pipeline in a portable manner across many execution platforms, and also keep together the problem of reproducibility using having built-in support for containers, and also providing uh, native support for the, uh, the management of the, uh, of the source code and the changes on, on, on your code base using and native support for Git, GitHub, and other platforms for source code development. So, to put, uh, to, put uh, to, to clarify a bit more, how does it work in practice? Let's say that I want to run a task like this. It's a simple task, it's one liner. I'm running BWA against a reference genome, and then I have it, the, 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 I send the output to another tool, some tools. And using this example, it will very basic example that I am by formations is able to trade also a not by implementation. This is just a basic Linux programming, but this is a very simple approach. Just using this operator, the file operator, allows me to run two parallel tasks. I have a true parallelism with this one liner. I have two tasks that communicate using a string between them. So this is efficient, it's very readable. Uh, by formatization, I like to use. The idea, the idea was not to break this moment. This is fantastic, but how to make it possible to run in a bigger cluster in the cloud in many instances, not just in a single machine with a, with a few CPU. And the idea was just to embed a uh, user script into a process definition that is a task definition that allows me to define what are the input I'm using my, my pipeline, in this case, just two tasks. And these are exactly the the file that I'm expecting to use in my script, and the reference pass file, and then the read the task file. And then another thing I need to define what are the outputs. In this case, the justice file, that is exactly the, the bound file created by the same tool. So nothing magic, but just with this simple definition, I'm able to define a precise contract, an interface between the task that I want to execute and the remaining part of my pipeline. No? This way I'm, I'm defining a clear separation. And next to the script is just a composition of many these tasks in the, in the same script. And um, the important thing to, to understand is how to communicate that these tasks in these scripts. Usually other framework, what they do is that basically from one task you can write the output in the, in the space in a common storage that is accessible also from the other two. But this is the perfect recipe for a disaster because if you allow multiple tasks to write in the same uh, storage, in the same file system, the same path, you open to a, a large amount of problem. Race condition, multiple access in the same, so on the same, on the same file. It's very complicated to manage, uh, to, 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 to avoid error. And also it's very complicated to recover possible uh, failed execution because the task can remain in a consistent state. So the idea here is to run each task in its own separate space directory and they communicate using another data structure. This data structure that we call channel. So what is going to happen? When I execute this task, BWA with some tools, 
this reduce the, the, the spy in the task working directory. But then the, the, the framework is able to take it, send over the channel, it triggers the execution of the other task that will execute these other uh, execution of some tools in a separate working directory. So we keep all, all of them uh, isolated. And this gives you an idea how we compose a path like this manner. Many tasks, they communicate with this data structure, they bring us to, to this data flow fragment model. Data flow is just uh, the definition of the input, well, I have two questions. One yeah. is uh, only fake files, or you can define them? Yeah. Like uh, no, no, you, here you can define. Files is the most common data structure, but in reality, you can use any in memory data structure, record, map, list, and whatever. And the second is uh, the file support like a streaming, so like if the Good. next uh, a script point. can uh, start even if the, it's not complete. So when something is producing a file, but you could start like with the first lines or. Not waiting until the whole file is done before starting the next step. So, mm, I think it between makes sense tasks or tasks. internally the same task? The same task. So, imagine the, same the task, task can do um, stars as, as the. The file. same task, the streaming is just the, 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 the Linux streaming. So, the stream, byte streaming. No, but I guess uh, the internal task, in some case, uh, need to wait, I guess, for the whole file to be done to start mm -hmm. working. And in other case, maybe. It makes sense to start processing as soon as the, the file is uh, being generated, let's say. In this case, if it's uh, file, mm, it will be it. lying based, I guess. Yeah. Or, uh, or no, in our case, we work the streaming at task level is not, between tasks is not possible right now. Okay. Because the idea is that these two tasks can run in completely separate environment. Maybe they can run two different nodes in a cloud environment without having so. There is no direct streaming. Okay. Could, could you stream records from a bound file one after another into a channel? Yeah, if you want a uh, low level streaming, you have to implement in the same task using the general Linux approach. Ah, but you couldn't, you couldn't also because if you have if you have the need of a streaming make no sense to split uh, the two tools in between two different processes. Not because at the end uh, they are they have direct dependencies. They have to execute in parallel one after another. Instead, if you split, there is no value. We, you know, we define two different tasks. When we can parallelize, for example, when it is executed just one time, and you want many of these. So you tend to separate. Otherwise, you can even mix all together, like in this case. You can stream here, more or less now. Maybe we can we'll go in details that. later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's in this. This is the idea of the data flow. So the data flow. So what I want to say is that I'm referring with the term data flow to a specific programming model that is used to define uh, parallel task execution in declarative manner. Basically, what's the the DNT's model? The model. Uh, all your tasks, your, your workflow definition are parallel by definition. There is no something that can be sequential. But what, what is happening, when I execute the script, all the tasks are launched together, but what they do is just wait for data. When there is a complete input definition, the task is automatically triggered, then process something that help would trigger the execution of a downstream task. So basically, this model allows me to define uh, a reactive network an agent that uh, work uh, in coordination between them, just waiting for data and producing other data. It is very efficient mo model to, 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 to manage this kind of application because with this simple model, I can create very complicated uh, parallel application. To try to clarify a bit more, does it work the parallelism? This model, imagine that I want to run uh, fast queue against a set of uh, fast few files. Um, what I need to do is just define this task, then I have the, the, the normal fast queue command line where there is the reads that is defined here like an input, and then produce the fast queue logs that I'm then defining here like an output, and then I'm connecting uh, this process, this task, what? To, to a channel factory. The, the, the channel connect processes, or if this is the first process, 
uh, I can use a pressure method to create a channel that contains this file. So very easy, an executing the script, take that file, the file goes into the channel, the channel actually execution the task. Okay, you may think why you have to use this Gizzer uh, syntax to do a very simple task, no? You, you could just run fastq uh, uh, um, against this file. The beauty in case when you want to parallelize the execution, not just with a single file with many files, but what I have to do here is just to change the declaration on the file create on the channel creation and saying I want to match all the all the I want to take all the files that match, for example, a uh, pattern, a globe pattern. What is happening now that all the files are sent over the channel and each of them trigger an independent execution of this task. So this is how the parallelization work. You don't have the need to use an iteration over the file, etc. Like an imperative programming language. And instead you use a declarative approach in which the data drive the execution of your pipeline. More data you give, more tasks you execute. And then the, this task can trigger execution of other tasks. So this is the, the idea that there is behind. Then also this, this framework give us uh, automatically implicit support for other, uh, for a series of other uh, platform. You can run the script not just locally but across a cluster of computer. Next to us, a bit support for Solar, Green Engine, uh, IBM, LSF, PBS, HD Condor. More recently, we had also the support for Kubernetes, this is a popular uh, cluster engine for cloud application, and the Ignite, the less known in memory data engine for data analytics. Then is useful in some deployments. Then cloud next was built in uh, first class support for Amazon Web Services. We can deploy a computational cluster using EC2 instances that is able to scale automatically depending on the workload, or it is possible also to use the new AWS batch service implement that implements basically a computing cluster in the um, Amazon uh, cloud. Regarding Google Cloud Azure is not a native support, but you can still deploy an extra application using Kubernetes on top of this cloud platform. Then, uh, containers, they are a key feature in Nextflow. Uh, there is the support for all the major uh, container runtime, Docker, that is the most famous one, and also for Singularity and Shifter that are a uh, container engine specific for HPC data center. So a few word, uh, more words about containerization, why it's so important, why everybody wants to use container, because dramatically simplify the deployment on dependencies or our pipeline. What's the idea of container? The container is the idea to create a, a self-configured uh, package in which you can include all the dependencies of your pipeline. So now, similar to a virtual machine, even though it's a completely different implementation. And uh, the beauty of containers is that once you have created this container, you can distribute the container along your pipeline. So you can uh, make it you, your you can execute your workflow with the tool that you originally included in your container. So how does it work is in practice with next row? Usually when you run your pipeline, the next row runtime execute many jobs. And these jobs then are executed in, in the, the data center in the, your cluster. And the problem with this, the common problem is that the job then depends on the environment configuration of the cluster. Uh, you need to store all the tools that are required by your pipeline in the target environment. The next flow the idea is very easy. Just wrap the execution of each job inside the container. The container provides all the tools, the, the execution context of, the, you know, of your, your application. So now your pipeline does not depend anymore in the execution on the tools provided by the, 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 the cluster, but is confined, is isolated by the container itself. So this guarantee that you are able to run the pipeline exactly with the same tool provided by the pipeline out there. This give a big plus. Um, okay. So a lot of things. How to, to make it is work in practice. Now we have seen container, different cluster, parallelization. So the idea when you run next to a script, you can use just the next tool is a command line tool. 
And what you have to, to use is next to the command, then the run, then the run command, and your script. This allows you to run your script in a machine like this. And then maybe you want to use container that we were saying. How to use the container? You just add the minus with drawer command line option. And then you spe specify the container image that you want to use. This can be a container you have created, or maybe a container made by somebody else that is uploaded in a registry, like by containers, etc. You just with command, you pull the container and run your script using that Docker image. Well, recently, uh, Nexo has also the support for Biocond. I'm sure that most of you know this too. This is a very popular package manager with a large set of bioinformatics uh, tools. So it's very useful. And, and we can use this approach to in place of the containers because just using the, the code environment file in which you define all the tools that you want to use, uh, you can run the same script using this Condom environment. Now, when you are finished to implement your pipeline, you're happy, maybe you develop your laptop, you are ready to, to run it with real data. How you do that? What you need to do is just to provide the configuration file in which you specify the configuration setting of the target execution environment. Here we are saying that I want to use like a secure or this line cluster. Then maybe you have to specify what is the queue that you want to use, the amount of resources, the number of the memory, the CPU, and eventually maybe also the container that you used before. Now you are using the container inside the cluster. And just providing this configuration file, you can run the same code into your, your cluster. So this is a, a simplify a lot of things. And then maybe you want to share also this pipeline with other you know, researchers, with other colleagues, they want to use the cluster and they do the cloud in this case. And maybe to just use the AWS batch service, you just specify a different executor that is not Slurm anymore, but it, it, it is AWS batch. And that's so is able to deploy the execution of the same pipeline, adapting the, the resource request to the API with AWS batch. No? So this is how we can manage to deploy the same piece of code in different infrastructure with minimal changes, above all, without touching the code. And this is what we think is very important, this ability to keep separated the source code of the application from the configuration of the application is what enables portable deployment, because you separate the infrastructure uh, configuration from the application logic. So another important thing is that Nextflow is open source software. Uh, you can download from GitHub at this URL. Um, but why the open source is supposed to be important? So say the no another way, what's the value? What's the value and importance of open source software? The most common idea is that it's important because I have free developers that are working for me. No? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this is not the real reason. This is a mis misconception somehow. Maybe it's more important because we have the possibility to, to read uh, the, the source code, so maybe we can also collaborate, find, understand better how does it work the, uh, this tool behind, eventually find also bug, maybe contributing to, 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 to the project, fixing some, 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 some bugs or providing new, new ideas, or maybe remixing the code with other projects. So these are some interesting aspect of the open source, but it's not the real value. In my opinion, the, the real value of open source is the fact that it allows to create community. In the meaning of that, uh, the open source provides the foundation which other people can build something else. And so there is a way to share a, no, a common knowledge that brings multiple people to work on something common. So for this reason, I was very happy this year when this project was launched, that is Nexo Core, that is a collection pipeline developed here in, co in collaboration with Quantity Bioinformatics uh, Center and the ESR, the journalist in Singapore, by my field. And it's really an important contribution, I think, because it shows exactly the, the importance of being open, because you allow other people to create something bigger. And the project is growing now. There are nine participating organizations, 30 contributors. There are 10 
high quality scalable pipelines and above all the community provide a really rich set of best practice uh, for the repeatability of this pipeline. They use containers, similar to the containers, also by Conda to create the containers, all the pipelines are tested automatically, so there is a, a really a good approach that make this analysis workflow very stable uh, for critical application. And then another interesting project I like to mention is this doc store. This is instead of an open platform that allows to collect uh, scientific data analysis workflow, mostly focused on uh, life science. And this is not a collection of tools, but it's a catalog uh, of tools. And this is, is nice because it makes the application findable, acc accessible by other people. It supports CWR, Reader, and NextFlow. So different, uh, different language. It is important because it shows also how there could be an interoperability between these two different uh, tools. Um, now, I would like to show you directly to give a quick demo. How does it work with this framework? Because I think this gives you much better idea on the of the mechanism that they, 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 they are behind. Let's say that this is doc store. I may I want to run uh, uh, look for uh, a pipeline, a run SI pipeline. Here and there are some pipeline I want to concentrate on workflow and then I can choose what language they are implemented. I may decide to use to restrict to use next flow and then I find there are two pipelines. I want to use maybe this one because it's made by Palojito Mazo that I know. Mm -hmm. And then there are some, some information. Okay, so the usual information with the other, the, the, the GitHub repository. I can to eventually can download them like a zip. Here there's the command line that I need to use to launch this pipeline. So it is useful because it gives me immediately the, the idea how to run this piece of software. Mm -hmm. There is the list of the version of the pipeline, so I can maintain at least our history of revision. Um, let's say that I want to see him, or what is I want to use the master. This is the GitHub repository of this, this pipeline. This is not in magic, this is just uh, the, 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 the GitHub uh, project. And the two main files in our next flow project are the main and nav and the configuration file. The main and nav contain more or less what we I was showing you before. But there are the definition of the different tasks this pipeline. This is a proof of concept RNA pipeline is not a real pipeline. But give you an idea what there is, how I can define this pipeline. There is a the index process that you use Salmon, and there is the quantification process always running uh, using Salmon, then there is task queue and the multi QC that collect all the uh, data uh, that is wrapped by the previous task and create a final report. So, now if I want to run this pipeline, what I need to do is just to use next flow, the MIL here. If I don't have, I can install with a single command get uh, next flow IO dash. Maybe I can make it bigger. Oh. Okay. This run a small installer. And once you download the next row launcher, you just move this into a directory in your pod. And you're done. And then we want to run this pipeline. This is way to, to run this just to take the, the project name. And then I can say next row run this project. Since the project contains a small data set, I'm able to execute this without neither to, to specify the data. No? Uh, this is crashing, but why is crashing? Because this is the command they try to execute. This is the exit status, and then here there is the error message. You see the fastq command of found. I'm doing this purpose because I want to show you that how I can use, basically I don't have fastq installed on this computer, but I can execute this code just specify with Docker. I should specify the container, but I 
also the possibility to put a container name in the configuration file and just with this flag now I'm able to run this pipeline uh, my computer using the container that is downloaded I already have the container but otherwise it would be downloaded on fly and allows me to run this, this pipeline uh, in an easy way mm, there it is so just to give you an idea, no? this allows me very easily to, to track and to execute a uh, complex uh, workflow without having to install all the, the components because I, I have isolated and put into a container. The container was defined in the configuration file that is this. So here in the configuration file, I'm saying that I'm using this container, then there is other parameter, like I was telling you before, to use LARM or maybe to use batch. Uh, a nice thing is that I may want to use a different version of this pipeline. Maybe I want to use the version 1.1 because in this version, I made a little different implementation. But to use this, a different version of my pipeline, what I need to do is just to specify in the revision. That, that is the zero. This is at the end, is nothing special, it's just a tag in the GitHub repository. So just using a tag feature of, of GitHub, I can define multiple revision my code, execute them this way. So what is this uh, very powerful? At the end, we are doing the same thing, but this allows me not just to track, to use the single command, the code, that was in that specific revision. But since in the GitHub repository, I can ask you say, I can put the configuration file. In the configuration file, there is the link with a unique container. Now I'm using a completely different container with all the tools that are in that container. So this single command, I can switch to a completely different implementation eventually in this pipeline. And then finally, there is the just to give you a idea how to run this thing in the cloud, in this, in this, in this configuration file, this pipeline, I put also the configuration of, to use AWS Batch. These are the settings that are required. Like I was telling you before, I need to specify, this is the most important thing, the AWS Batch Executor. Then Batch has the concept queue, like a cluster. And then there are the region, other details. This is the, the bucket where the intermediate data is stored. So if I want to run the same code now using a cloud service, I need to specify that pro configuration provided that is batch. And then that now I submit the execution, the same pipeline using the AWS batch executor. Now it takes longer because I submitted this stuff into the cloud. The a batch service needs to spin the CTU instances, process this stuff. So a bit more, but give you an idea how we can switch between different environments with few command line options. An important thing to track in a consistent manner all the configuration. I don't have to remember every time I need to put this and that, but everything is tracked with GitHub. This is the configuration to use batch. It's there. And um, okay, this will take some few minutes, but we can give her in place it. Um, ah, a quick comparison with other tools. This is a common question. So, uh, playing advanced, making a short comparison. Galaxy. Galaxy is very popular. Surely, they, they, they the most used uh, bioinformatics platform uh, out there. But they are very two different uh, concept um, idea behind. Galaxy is a web platform, so it is a tool that. With the idea to provide a user interface, so uh, NetFlow is a common line oriented tool. So they are two different audience, two different type of users. I would like to say there are people that prefer to use uh, user interface, other people that prefer prefer to use common line tools. NetFlow is for this kind of people. Uh, Galaxy has a rich set of tools that they provide. NextFlow does not provide any direct integration because the idea of NextFlow was to allow to run directly any tools. You don't need to have a specific wrapper or whatever. You can write the task definition of any tools that you want. So we don't need to provide an integration for that. Uh, Galaxy 
as it does not provide a great control over parallelization, that makes sense because it's a web, uh, web oriented tool. This time, Nextflow is more program and language, so you have much more fine control on the parallelization, the scalability of your, your tools. Scalability, surely, Galaxy scale, by average, we could say that is used for workload that can be around some thousand jobs. It is not an hard limit, but I, I haven't seen much bigger workload. Um, Galaxy, with Nextflow you can scale uh, up to some millions of jobs. And then Galaxy requires some installation where you need IT people to, to manage because it's a server, server, server software, so it requires some maintenance. Nextflow is just a tool that you download around, so a completely different approach. So in conclusion, Galaxy, I would say that it's more suited for training or for people that prefer to uh, the interaction with our user interface. Uh, Nextflow is more suited for production workload for people that are expert uh, and prefer to work with command line option with direct, with direct touch with the with tool. Snake make uh, Nextflow. <coughs> they are too similar, too similar too. Actually, I was inspired by Snake Make when I started this project. Uh, they both both of them command line oriented tools. The first difference is the, the computational model. Uh, then make take, uh, is inspired by make, basically uh, in what is called a pool model, because basically when you run make or snack make, what it's trying to do is to recreate the last file that you have with your pipeline. Then infer all the tasks that are missing for that file. So it's coming back, basically. This time, Nextflow uses a completely different model that is based on the push model. You give some data that the data trigger the execution of the task, they trigger the execution of the following task, etc. Uh, interesting difference is how to compute the, the graph on the dependencies. Is NetMate is needs to be pre-computed. Before the execution starts, NetMate creates all the graph and then starts to traverse the graph. Instead, <coughs> Nextflow this is computed at runtime. And the difference, and this gives an advantage for, in some cases, for some, 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 some cases in next row, because creating a big DAG for a very big wor workload with many files can be, can be, li can be difficult and take a lot of time. Instead, the next row managed to, to stream the execution for a large uh, computation in an easier way. Then, okay, that's like maybe uh, only the support for singularity, next row. Support uh, all the major container runtimes. And then, what is interesting? Like me, as an interesting thing, support sub workflow. Next, so it does not yet support for more uh, sub workflow, something we would like to implement. Um, then, the, the, the last important big difference is that Snake Make is based on Python. This makes my implementation very happy because it's the most common popular uh, programming language. Next, so instead, use a Groovy design. Always a scripting language somehow similar to Python, but it is based on the Java virtual machine, so a different word somehow. Finally, CWA and Nextflow, they are two different, completely different things, um, because CWA is not a, a, a framework, it's not a platform, it's a language specification. Instead, Nextflow is a language and a runtime to execute that language. Uh, CWA is based on the clarity meta language, you define your workflow using some, some, uh, some tag, using on YAML and JSON. Inside Nextflow, as I was you know, telling you before, is a DSL implementing top of general purpose programming language. So that will tend to be a bit verbose. For each task, you have to define a YAML file, and then you need another, another YAML file to compose all of them, that you need a YAML file for the input file. So, there is um, tend to be a lot of things you need to write. Next, so we can try to be as much as possible concise and, and fluent when possible. And then next, to, no, uh, CWA is committee driven. There are some people that sit together and decide how to move in the project. Well, instead, next, to, I would like to say this community driven, the meaning that uh, we receive the feedback by the people, community, I have this bug, I have this problem, I like to have this feature, etc. And then we try to improve the two over time. Um, and then the, the big difference between these two words is that the idea we have to have a unique specification 
in many implementation, each implementation for a specific platform. Instead, with Nextflow, we want to have just a single implementation that we can deploy everywhere. So this makes the tool, in my opinion, more, more stable, because when you have many implementations, it's very easy that there are differences in the implementation between all the different versions. So then you can have some problems. OK, there are, so these are some other information. These are the execution reports. Very quickly, I will show execution report. Create by next when I execute a pipeline. This is the credit goes to, to film. It was the, the main force behind to create this report. And um, there are some, some metadata information issue. The resources that are used by the execution of your pipeline for each task, also for the memory. Then there is also <clears throat> a summary for each, all the tasks with all the, the, the same information in a more detailed manner, the memory allocated, and there are much more columns that are not visible here. Uh, this is another representation of the execution timeline. Each line represents a line, show when it starts, when it's finished. That is the, the graph of the, the execution of your pipeline, the DAG. Um, okay, these are two, two, two to the small add-ons, there are two syntax highlighter for atom and visual code and from that right with the, this code. So toward the conclusion, what's one of the things on which we are going to, to work? We want to improve the, maybe the language to make it even more simple to use, more expressive when, uh, when possible to handle better some use cases. This is a big thing on which we need to work uh, to allow the composition workflow, allowing to to aggregate different Excel workflow into a bigger one. It's a challenging extension, but uh, it will be very useful. Another important thing on which we would like to work is how to keep together multiple tasks when it comes to task affinity. Either we would like to, uh, to keep together tasks using the same data on the same computing node. It makes no sense that uh, a task producing something on a node, then you are executing the other task in another node. Either they should be co-located. And the same, better scattered option also for Kubernetes, that is continually uh, innovating, providing new features, so we would like to, to, to keep the pace with Kubernetes, that is an important piece of software. Another interesting thing on which we are, we are working, the, the ability to predict the resource usage. What I mean? Imagine that when you execute a task, now what you can do, define the resources, the computer resources that you want to use, the time, the memory, eventually also the disk or the search that you want to use. And the problem is with this approach that quite surely, it's actually difficult to estimate how much resource you need in practice. Generally, people put this randomly. And also, yeah. <laughs> and also, another very common problem is that the same task can have different instances, or the same task can have very different requirements. Because the, the change can be very heterogeneous. You can have uh, an instance that requires 10 gigabytes, another instance that requires 20 gigabytes. So what we are doing now, we can, now we can do something like this, we can to try to execute the task if it is failing, and the second task, the, the, the second time the task is executed, you can allocate the memory in a dynamic manner. So you can retry really to execute until the task finally succeeds. It then would be inside to, to use a predictive model, so we could try to execute the execution of the first, uh, the first, let's say, 100 tasks or more, and then we use this information, the real usage, uh, with the memory at the time to train a model. And then using this model, after a while, I could start to, to predict the real usage using the real usage of the CPU, the, no, the time and the memory, with also the metadata on all the input files. And then continually, we could try to, to, to improve the model while it is continuing to execute. It can be a nice idea in my opinion. Finally, another challenging project would be to enable the support for Apache Spark. Apache Spark is a very popular uh, clustering uh, engine for an analytics application in particular. There are also very interesting application genomics. Um, but it's complex to, to manage. Uh, 
And the idea would be to, to merge as well, to, to mix the, the two technologies so that it would be possible to write hybrid next to a script that allows to, to mix lots of Spark applications in the Spark programming model. And this would be very useful, useful because it would make it possible to, to execute the next flow, legacy tool, but DWA, or whatever, uh, using the next flow approach of wrapping any command line tools. At the same time, I could use, when possible, native Spark application like JTK4 in the same, the same analysis workflow. Would be very useful. So, uh, conclusion. And the last point. Last point are that data analysis reproducibility is difficult, and above all, it is often dismissed. And when you realize that you have a problem of reproducibility, reproducibility usually is too late. So, it, my suggestion to take this seriously from the beginning, this problem. Next tool does not provide a magic solution, but it is important to enable what well, best practice and the support for community industry standards that dramatically simplify uh, the approach to solve the problem of reproducibility. Applications that are revealed in Nextflow can be deployed in different classes, different environments, also the cloud with a few commands, with a few settings. Also, what is important, there is a growing community of people collaborating, sharing, sharing um, very high quality pipeline uh, using this framework. So, uh, this work, give a try. Thank you. I think uh, the opportunity to say thanks to some people in my lab, Evan Flo and Sadino Dida. Obviously, thanks to the field for inviting me and more work to contribute to this project. And thank you. Last things, we organized a workshop on November in Barcelona. If you're interested, there are still a few seats. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Um, yeah. uh, I was wondering, is, is there a tracking system for the files that are generated during the workflow? So Can you repeat? Yeah. Meaning that um, if you generate an output in one of the tasks mm -hmm. and then the job fails mm -hmm. somewhere along mm -hmm. the way, can you restart the workflow? Yeah, obviously. Start from yeah, there? that was um, one of the, 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 the main points. Also, the reason why we keep each task separate each other, because it was the point that I was trying to explain before. If you have a workflow that is crashing, and you have a task that is stopping for whatever reason, it can create intermediate files that you don't know. No? And these intermediate files can be fast flagged for the charter execute. Instead, the idea of next will each task run in its own directory. And somebody is crashing, you can Try to understand what is what is the problem. Fix the the problem. Then you execute the execution. The framework is able to recognize all the tasks that were successfully executed. And skip them, and then when there is the task that crash, discard completely that task and execute only the the, the task that failed. Yeah, basically you have to use minus resume command line option. That is. I'm sorry. I'm following on that point, um, if you. Okay, you should. Zero. Okay, this is the the one on on batch. If I say resume, you will see mm. cash, 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 cash. Okay. And following on that, if you execute everything successfully, and but then you change one of your input files. Mm -hmm. Recognize the change. Okay. And yeah, because this number. This number are basically hash key. Okay. It is created with your command all the input files. As soon as there is a change in your command for the input file, change the hash key so you start the execution of your task. Okay, thanks. Um, sort of following on from that, is there a way to if if a process crashes and I want to go in and can I go into the directory yeah. and sort of make some changes and yeah. to Let's see. Uh, I'm trying to to make a real example. Let's say that I want to I change the code that is okay. Let's say that I want to run and I want to work on this code. To work this code, I can say let's look clone this project, copy. I'm making a copy of this project here. 
Okay, copy. So here I have all the code. I can modify the main and nav. And then let's say that we we want to modify here and put in something randomly. Now let's draw run main with Docker. And we launch the execution on this. Opla. Quantification. Oops. It's complaining. The, 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 the framework tells you that something is wrong. What is the, the error message? And above all, tell you exactly what is the part where the task where was executed. You can change here and you find all the files that are needed to work with this. Maybe. This is confusing. Is there are all the files that you huh? have. I didn't understand. In the work directory. Yes. Uh, local. Yes. Even if you run on batch. Uh, it's supposed to be a shared, uh, shared file system. Okay. And what I want to say is that here you have, you have all the files to, to execute this task, even without next to it. It could re execute just say next to a run that is the wrapper of the real task. The real task is the, the code. Uh, the command, the command sh. I could realize that here there is something broken. I could fix. Then I could test just saying command run. And when I'm happy, I fix the main code in the pipeline and restart the execution. So okay, come back here and then I fix my main code in the pipeline. I restart the execution. There is here resume, and you will see that the first one, the first one is cached, the second one, the other are submitted. Okay. So, the, yeah. so even though you changed, you made the change, you ran it successfully. When you made the change in the main, in the main Mexico pipeline, the original command you ran is now discarded, even though it ran successfully. Mm -hmm. okay. But what I do is make, make a lot is I, I take something local mm -hmm. and I sort of I, I get Snipnik to see that the file is created successfully and then I don't have a big run. Yeah, because maybe it is a different system, you type stash on file, no? Like make. Yeah, exactly. Instead the uh, next code use a different approach. Use an hash code generated on the input file and the script. I see. So, so if I could figure out what the hash code is, I could move the directory to that. But the important thing to know is that the hash code is unique. That is them. Okay. But even in Snapnik, the correct way to fix it would be to, to fix the workflow and then on Snapnik shift. If you want to have a reproducible workflow, you don't want to have a Yeah, but in fact, I mean, the fact what actually happens is you write a, you write a workflow as you're going along. This is in my, mm -hmm. in my work, I write it, and then I'm trying to troubleshoot the, the workflow. I go through 10, 15 iterations, eventually I get to the point mm -hmm. where it's what I like it to be. And then I can take the time to rerun my whole workflow to make sure I get the same right. thing. Again, you have to use the to wash the name. Explicitly. So simply, I could go in and say, okay, this is a small change. Technically, I'm supposed to rerun the same thing. But for this, for this, just because it's a very expensive mm -hmm. operation, I, I don't want to run it now because mm -hmm. I want to just put my put my to get it to the end so that I know that something that works. And no, then I, can I think it, 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 it is a big deal that you have that you, you completely separate the task execution from the pipeline itself. It's a really a great help. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. uh, because we are in the real world what is happening that you have a pipeline that crash after two days, three days, you cannot restart everything. So you, but you can take just that task this feeling, you can troubleshoot as much as possible because we have everything to, to, to fix, to troubleshoot the problem in that task. There are input file scripts. So you don't need anything else. Once you get what's the problem, you can fix the main application. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. I have a question for you. At the end, you talked about future work and you said that you're hoping to bring in something which could automatically determine how long tasks typically have run. Mm -hmm. is, that, does it, is that learning happening just within a single execution of the workflow? Or can it learn from previous that times? Idea, yes. But that could be extended also to uh, knowledge base. 
people to have like a web based database where everyone who's ever run the salmon for a different file yeah, size. Yeah, then you can start to work that again. That's just a uh, concept, but I think that could be extended from a lot of uh, single execution modes so it could be possible to extend to what they're saying. It could be a uh, common storage in which there are all the history of execution of uh, something like this. And you could provide much more information for it. Maybe you could play for like a subsample of your sample that runs through the whole pipeline. I didn't understand. Uh, uh, you, you could take the first uh, data and then mm -hmm. take a subsample of five percent or one percent. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> maybe because maybe it doesn't work. This is a simple trick. When you define the input, you could you know, kind of specify the presentation because being a streaming approach, you don't know. The pipeline doesn't know the app. But you can say, okay, I want to run the first 100 samples, the first 10, first 1,000, and that stops. So you can put a parameter that say, okay, run only in the first 10. That is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. I was curious, since you generate the graph at runtime, can you guarantee that we will know cycles? Can yeah, we be no cycles? In the, yeah. in the graph, you mean? Yeah. Yes, because there is a check. If you... Oh, actually, oh, you, you can have cycles. Mm -hmm. You can have also a kind of feedback loop. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is possible because uh, you can use a, a, a channel that is declared like an output, but you can reuse an input at the beginning. So this is possible to, to implement. It's very unusual, but you can do it. Yes, yeah. If I go to the dog store, uh, so you show that if I request the pipeline there, mm -hmm. is there a containers are associated with it? You can store containers or not? Dog store is not a story in the container. They just track the, the metadata. So the link to the GitHub repository, the container name, and I think it goes away the tag on the container. So keep track that way. But that does not store the data. Um, is there a way to, so this is sort of coming back to one of the earlier questions, I think mm -hmm. the first one came up, um, where we're talking about streaming the file. Mm -hmm. Is there a way, let's say you have a simple text file, you want to stream every single record of that text file mm -hmm. into, a, into a channel. Mm -hmm. There's, there is a possibility of doing that, right? Yeah, yeah. No, if it's a very big, uh, if it is a very big file, that could be supported by kind of, so. You have to the advance. Okay. Yeah, because that's the each, each line is stated, then expand to the to the, to the process that are crunching this stuff, the usual process that are smaller than the, the, the stream itself. So there is not a desktop mechanism that would be very useful. And I think that ideally there should be a mechanism that uh, the processing task be able to stop the streaming process. This is not uh, possible now, but it is something that we can do much. I have a question regarding the um, channel API. So you show an example where you start your workflow reading a file. So my first question is, uh, what kind of uh, storage backend do you support? Apart from, uh, I guess, like usually you read from MFS in a HPC mm -hmm. system. But you were showing that you were supporting uh, S3. But the well. channel, the next flow channel are just in memory data structure. That does not have um, uh, okay. a storage behind. It's not like Spark. All right. It's just everything in memory. All right. But you were showing that uh, you were reading from uh, from a path. I'm uh, reading from a path, but when I'm doing the dial, switch it on. I'm just showing here this one. Yeah, exactly. From yeah, but this one is not streaming the content of the file. It's not reading the content of the file. Mm -hmm. It's just giving you the path. Oh, right. It's yeah, giving the path. Yes, because uh, these are, this is not the, the spark logic. This is the mm -hmm. common. Uh, positive process logic that they expect to work on files. 
Right. Yeah, but you can, there is another operator that allows you to split the file and then provide the file, but that case always is sort of like a file. But also, if you give it a URL, it will download. Yes, that's true. Yeah, here you can specify HTTP or S3, column slash slash, etc. but yeah, still working here. Question. And then the other question is, um, like, it, like you were saying, the splitting of the file. Like, uh, how does this happen? Does it happen within a single machine, or, or there is a... It's not a single machine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, then I was curious about the Ignite uh, implementation, mm -hmm. because all of the other systems, like Kubernetes, Larn, and they are like mm -hmm. batch-like systems, while Ignite is something uh, mm -hmm. more for interactive analysis. So how, how does... Uh, hey, Ignite? Ah, uh, yeah, maybe a slide that didn't show here. Usually, we, we could, um, uh, oh, uh, maybe I have to do this. Okay. Usually when we run next row, run something like this, there is an instance that submit the jobs to the cluster. So this can be can run on the head node or like a computing node, and then all of that, oh, then they just an XO and submit the jobs into a, a batch scheduler. They can be also Kubernetes or whatever. Ignite, how it is used now by an XO, is used in a different way. Allow us to do something like this. If we want to run an XO into a AC2 cluster, cluster on Amazon, or even a super data, super computer data center like DSC, you cannot use the, the, the model that I was showing you before because they does not allow you to send 1,000 job execute them in parallel. So what you can do is with a single job request, you allocate certain nodes. Then in each company node will launch an XLO instance. And then what is happening so this work basically like an MP application also, like a Spark, applica a Spark application. Uh, the first instance become the, the next row driver that run the you know, workflow application. And the other are daemon. Basically this daemon run Ignite daemon. So Ignite is a computer engine that allows, allow, that is embedded in next row, and it's possible to use to define next row in this model where you have many, uh, many, uh, demo that process your pipeline execution. And eventually this could be the idea to, to integrate this part because it could be possible to, uh, to use Ignite to launch the execution of Spark demo in each of these nodes. And then basically then this will make it possible to create a Spark context inside our next web application. Yeah, they have an integration with Ignite, but it's mostly for uh, sharing RDDs between uh, different Spark jobs. But uh, yeah, so basically, when you run uh, when you run a process, uh, you use this sort of Ignite map, and then you mm -hmm. do execution of a bash script or mm -hmm. code, I guess, or you use it just to start an extra demo. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but this is managed by by the framework itself. So Ignite has a feature to start. Uh, yeah, right. Spark. Any more questions? Good. All right, in that case. Thank you. Thank you.